Welcome to the WW News Today podcast. My name is Eric Morton. With me, as always, is Tom Corliss, my partner in crime. Uh, and Tom, this is episode seven. Seven? Yeah, seven. And then what do you think about that? Well, now we're going to get all the questions as to why was that a big deal, all the people that somehow aren't in on the seven joke by now. Do you want to take this opportunity to explain the seven joke? <sighs> I since, can. I mean, we do it a lot. Sure. Um, so in the original test track at Epcot, the General Motors test track, there was a pre-show with actual people in it, an actual pre-show. And in that pre-show, was, it was uh, Sherry and Bill, Bill McKim, Bill and McKim. they were the ones who were going to put together your test schedule for your, for your vehicle. And at one point, he asks Sherry to put up the environmental test. She says, put up two, five, and seven. And Sherry looks at him and goes, seven? He goes, yeah, seven. Like the most extreme test ever. Yeah. So whatever, and it ends up that's the corrosive test, right? Um, but yeah, my my cousin and I, when we were very young, that was like one of the things we liked to quote and and always say every time we saw that attraction. It became a thing outside of it. Anytime someone said seven, we would always do it. I started doing it on the podcast like 16 years ago, and I forced everyone who's ever worked here to do it to the point at which even after they're long gone, they hear the number seven, and they cannot help but think of this stupid thing. But yeah. Well, seven. There you have it. Uh, we yeah. we actually That's probably the most often asked question in comments. It's, so yeah. There we have it. Uh, we are on part two now of our unbuilt Disney attractions. Yeah. So we went through uh, it's top 64. We did a March Madness episode on this a couple of years ago on WW News Tonight. Yeah. And we are going through the top 64 uh, unbuilt attractions at Disney. We went through the first part. I think it went pretty well. Yeah. Uh, a lot of cool stuff in there that I wish had happened. Some stuff that you yeah. can understand why it didn't. You know, uh, before we do attractions, though, I, I read something the other day that I'd forgotten, which was... Uh, an undone Disney thing, but not an unbuilt attraction. Uh, John Candy was supposed to be in Pocahontas. Did you know that? Who was he supposed to play? Uh, the they Red had King? a sidekick character for her named Red Feather. He was a turkey, and he talked. Oh, yeah, And they yeah, 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 had yeah, yeah. actually recorded some of the lines uh, and done some early work yeah. on the project uh, before, uh, unfortunately, he passed away. And then they decided not to do any kind of talking sidekick yeah. character at all. Which, if you've so. seen that movie, is probably for the best. Yeah. That would have seemed really out of place, I think. Well, it would have just changed the whole tone of the movie. Who knows what we would have Yeah, I like – and then for me, the highlight of that movie is, number one, the music, and number two, it's like the animal characters that don't necessarily speak, right? So Miko and Percy, and I like those characters, but anyway. Yeah. Pugs were a big part of uh, Native American culture back in the day. And also the men in black. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Actually, that's what happened. They came to visit her, gave her the pug, and then hit her with the flashy thing. And But talking anyway, turkey in that movie just sounds like the dumbest idea. It does, but if it were John Candy, I think it would somehow I be mean, a I genius. I love John Maybe. Candy. I don't know. Yeah. We'll see. We'll never know. Yeah. All right, first up. Unbuilt. We ought to mention that we have the wigs. The wigs are watching live. Oh, I almost didn't, didn't mention, mention it. it. Yeah. The wigs. If you're a wigs member, yeah. you are uh, able to watch us live as we record this right now, getting a studio view from Jake. Uh, thank you to the wigs that are watching at $7 and above level. You get to watch us do all of these. We're doing a lot this week because November is a busy month. Yeah. I'm going to be gone for several, you know, a couple weeks there. You're going to be gone for a few weeks there. Yeah. Yeah. I'm. You got it a little bit more exciting, right? You're going on a Baja, a Disney Baja cruise, with and Jason, <laughs> with Jason, with sleep. <laughs> Think of the person it would be the weirdest to go to Baja with, and if you could come up with someone weirder than Jason <laughs> Diffendall to go to that destination with, I will give you a thousand dollars. I want to see when you hit the first port in Baja and Jason's like, I'm here for the berry blast. <laughs> you Baja great. blast? Yeah, the, what, the berry. Baja berry blast. It's not I don't know. Berry? Know it's not I berry. Know. I guess I don't know my mountain. There's no do. berry in Baja blast. He's just here for the blast. There's no crying in baseball I'm and just, there's no berry I'm in just Baja blast. here for the blast. <laughs> No, I would go on that trip with Jason. And we'll have a good time. I'm joking. But also, like, two two people that are at least likely to lounge on a beach are going to Baja. But anyway. Two people that also could get into a fight. That'll be fun. No? No fight. Okay. If you do find somebody to vlog it, please. Sure. 
Find someone with a camera. So anyway, Wigs, if you are interested in becoming a Wigs member, you can go to www.nt.com slash Patreon or patreon.com slash WWNT. Either one of those yeah. works. We've made it easy for you. Uh, you could be a Wigs member for as little as two bucks a month, but once you get to the $7 and above level, Seven. you get things like... You get things like the post shows, or in this case, we are giving them right now. It's kind of a trial. We're giving yeah. them a live look at uh, when we record these. And they also get so early access. They interact here. We have a Discord community. They can they can tell us stuff while we're yeah. recording a show. And they get early access. If you miss the live, you still get early access. Yeah, it's still yeah. there. And they get early access when we have an event or something like that. Yeah. They can get it. And when we release uh, something like a shirt, yeah. right, they get early access to that, which comes in handy because the most recent shirt – we released on Carousel of Products. I think we forgot to do that for the Gertie shirt. But we'll sold do out it. in thirty minutes. We'll do it for the next release. Though. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're reprinting those. Yeah. Normally, we do not reprint no, on Carousel of Products, but, but we was, vastly underestimated. Demand. Nothing's uh, ever sold out in an hour, so we had to do. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Thir- it was at twenty five minutes um, out of the like the two hundred we have. Yeah. Um, at twenty five minutes, and we had something like twenty left, and they were all the odd sizes, right? So, yeah. and then. Uh, shortly thereafter, sold out. Uh, we're going to be restocking those. The Gertie shirt, very Santa much into Gertie, me. Jolly with Santa Nights, Gertie. Yeah. So, we're very happy about that. Thanks to the Wigs for joining us. Thanks for your support. Yeah. It means a lot to us. All right. Now we can begin. Now do we want to get into this? The Mary Poppins Dark Ride. Now, this uh, could have been Disneyland or Epcot. It's been proposed for both. Uh, when Tony Baxter was a student in college, he began designing a Disneyland attraction that would take visitors on a magical ride through one of his favorite films. I thought Mary Poppins was like the very best Disney live action animation film I'd ever seen, Baxter said. And I thought it's just natural to do a ride at Disneyland. Maybe if I do a concept idea, I could get hired by these guys, right? Baxter's proposed ride starts on a carousel before the horses jump off the carousel onto an overhead track. Riders then travel through the chalk sketches through which Mary Poppins herself was transported uh, with Bert, Jane, and Michael in the film. After seeing the horse race and meeting the penguins, a thunderclap washes riders out of the chalk pictures. They find themselves over the rooftops of London where the chimney sweeps put on a show. Finally, the horses fly back to their carousel to the chorus of Let's Go Fly a Kite. Baxter's design did catch the eye of Disney producer Bill Anderson, but rather than hire Baxter on the spot, Anderson encouraged the young designer to continue his training and offered him some pointers. Baxter got his degree three years later and then joined Disney shortly after graduating and stayed with the company for 47 years. The attraction was considered for Disneyland and again for Epcot years later. This, you know, we talked about what are the most famous Unbuilt attractions of all time, I think Western River and some of the ones we had last week are in that conversation. The one that seems the most illogical as to why it's never been built might be Mary Poppins. Like one of the most famous, not only Disney films of all time, but just films in general, right? It is beloved. People adore this movie. And the most we ever got was a scene in the great movie ride, which was, you know, part of my fondness of the movie ride is the fact that it was a lot of movies I loved finally kind of got there doing a theme park ride, right? And Mary Poppins and Wizard of Oz, certainly the two at the top of that list. Right. But why this – the fact that no one ever pulled the trigger on this is is nonsense. I don't understand. Yeah. Even the much scaled down dark ride version that was announced for Epcot. Uh, well, the, it was a flat ride budget with projections. Cut. Yeah, flat ride. So. Yeah. Whatever you want to spinning call it. Spinning teacup ride teacup with thing, projection yeah. surfaces around it, yeah. Uh, even that, which World is uh, a great deal less than what Tony Baxter had imagined. We still didn't get married. Right? They still I couldn't just, put that in. I wanted the street, right? I thought the street was cool. And if, if uh, Admiral Boom was going to come out every hour and fire the cannon and just mm-hmm. the atmosphere back there would have been tremendous. That's what I was looking forward to. The ride, I was like, I don't really care about the ride, but, but the street would have been cool. And the fact... Disney needs to revisit this. Like, they need to revisit the idea of Mary Poppins having an attraction in their parks. Like, I, I understand wanting to focus on newer IP, but there are some of these legendary older films that you could build an attraction and people would be over the moon and show up in droves. And I think Mary Poppins, Jungle Book, Lion King, I think there's a bunch of those that 
we've still never really done anything with and, and are begging for it. Uh, Mary Poppins, as old as it is, very really still connects with people, I think. I think oh, yeah. People see her, instantly recognize her when they yeah. walk by at Epcot at the meet and greet and things like that. And, yeah. And look, there's a beautiful setting for it right there. I, I see no reason not to do it except, I guess, money. They're still um, theming the Mary Poppins. The Grand Floridian's covered in Mary yeah. Poppins, so it's obviously a timeless you know, film. It's not like someday people are going to wake up and forget Mary Poppins. It's not going to happen. You think it's just one of those IPs that they're like, oh, that'll always be there if we need it. We'll just keep I just think something. Then... I just think something always happens every time they try to do this, and then no one is brave enough to probably pitch an e-ticket for Mary Poppins. They the brought poor the Dick Van Dyke like onto the stage to announce this at D23. Yeah, because right? Bob Chapek you know, needed, needed his moment as usual. It's sad. Well, I would like to see it. Let's hope, you know, some of these are misses, but this one this one seems like a no-brainer. This would have been great, yeah. All right. A couple real good ones in a row. Do you want me to take this one? Yeah. Uh, Dragon Tower at Disney's Animal Kingdom, uh, which, of course, Animal Kingdom focused on three types of animals, existing, extinct, and those that don't exist, the fantastic. The latter was not fully featured in the park until the Yeti and the creatures of Pandora were added years later. But there was a land, of course, planned for 1998, which will, would include mythical beasts. That was Beastly Kingdom, including animals such as dragons, unicorns, and sea monsters. Beastly Kingdom was to be comprised of realms surrounding good and evil creatures. The evil side would have featured an attraction called Dragon Tower, which was ruled by a greedy, fire-breathing dragon that housed a treasure in the tower's chamber. The attraction would also involve a group of bats threatening to take the dragon's throne and riches. The bats would enlist the guests to help them uh, help and take them on a wild roller coaster ride to do so. The climax, similar to other rides, would involve an encounter with the dragon himself, resulting in a near charring of the guests. This eventually becomes Dueling Dragons at Islands Island of Adventure. Adventure. Obviously, a much cheaper version of this becomes Dueling Dragons. There's no animatronics. There's a, a you know, not the bat story. There's none of that. Instead, Universal goes all in on the fact that they've they've they're going to build the first ever, you know, dueling um, suspended roller coaster. Right. That's the that was also probably the best queue in Universal history. And now it's a Halloween Horror Nights yeah. house and one of yeah. my favorites of all time. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. So I mean, it's no secret a bunch of people that worked on Animal Kingdom ended up over on Islands of Adventure. Um, a lot of Disney people in general, people that worked on Disneyland Paris, people that worked on Disney Sea, and that's why between those three projects, you, if you go to Islands of Adventure, there are certain little places and areas you go to, and you're like, it's a little bit of Animal Kingdom, it's a little bit of Disneyland Paris, it's a little bit of Disney Sea, because it's the same people. Now, the same money wasn't spent on Islands of Adventure, but um, it has these moments where it's like, yeah, that kind of that kind of feels like that. I mean, we touched on Poseidon's Fury, yeah, on last week's episode, and Flight of the Unicorn, yeah which was a unicorn maze at Animal Kingdom, yeah. All right, well, I I think a lot of people would still like to see Beastly Kingdom. I think people are disappointed that never happened. I think um, Pandora is the spiritual successor yeah. and is probably more popular than Beastly Kingdom would have ever been. I, I, think, I think the odds are at this point, if they built Beastly Kingdom in 1998... I don't think we'd want to know what it would look like now. Because I think it would be IP laden already. The the weird part about Pandora is, and this is just my opinion, I realize this is a blockbuster film. Avatar is a blockbuster film. It made yeah. billions of dollars. But I think it made billions of dollars because of the intrigue of like the use of 3D and CGI and all these things. I don't think that people had a deep connection to the characters of Avatar no. as much or the story. It's I visuals. think it was the, spec the visual spectacle of it. So when they built this area, everyone was had low expectations. And then they went in there and like, wow, this is actually better than the film in many uh, yeah. cases, right? And so, one of the best theme park lands ever built, right? But we got our dragons, right? Banshees, are, they're dragons. We got it. And it's, Avatar Flight of Passage is a fantastic Yeah, film, so. I mean, that it basically is this mystical land of, of creatures that never existed. It, I think it, it ended up better. And, like, look at, look at Islands of Adventure, right? They stole all these ideas. Do any of them still exist? Nope. They're all gone. That entire land, completely gone at this point. Pretty Except much. Except for Mythos. Mythos. You can yeah. go eat at Mythos and have a kebab they still and have a, talk to a fountain. Talk to the fountain. You can talk to the fountain. Um, other than that, yeah. I can't think of anything that's left. No, the, the unicorn, dragons, uh, the Sinbad show, yeah. and and Poseidon, all, all, all long gone. gone. 
All right. Here's one that'll get you get your blood going. Yeah. Bald Mountain. This is not a Jason themed attraction. No. No. Um, the Bald Mountain from Fantasia was uh, to have been built near or on the exact spot as the Twenty Thousand yeah. Leagues Under the Sea attraction at Magic Kingdom. Um, to draw guests to this portion of the park, the attraction would house a log flume themed to Disney villains. Yeah. Also known as Villains Mountain, this attraction would take guests through a hair-raising experience of escaping from some of Disney's most famous evil characters. As a log flume, guests would have boarded long boat-style rafts modeled after Hades boats and Hercules. Guests would have been taken through Chernabog's Mountain, where the villains were meeting to decide who was the most evil and how to take over the Magic Kingdom. Suddenly, guests would be attacked by a combination of Disney villains saved only by a slide deep down the plunge in front of the mountain. You know, they say good ideas never die, and of course we saw that what's beyond Big Thunder concept yeah. there, you know. I mean, this would be a ride just with all the Disney villains that would, who wouldn't love that? Here's the thing I don't like about it is I don't like this idea that the villains are taken out of their stories, their individual stories, and put as like this co-op, this imaginary co-op of villains from different universes all coming together. I'd rather have them just stick with Chernabog or stick with Maleficent or whoever. They're evil enough on their own. We don't need them getting together and having a bureaucratic meeting to but discuss But that's these the things. story of Magic Kingdom, essentially, right? Like all the Fantasyland friends get together. You ever seen a castle stage show or a parade? They all get together. They all do live in the same universe. Right, but I think that's different than having an attraction where they're having a meeting, like a homeowner's, an HOA yeah, meeting. Yeah, I don't know about like the meeting part. Like, rrr, rrr, but your like, grass is too long. But if they, like, all met to, like, we're going to take over the Magic Kingdom, like Maleficent got them all together, that'd be, I'm okay. I'm on board with that. A land that's, like, self-referential, like, like Toontown. So Toontown, the story is Mickey and friends always lived behind Disneyland, right? Yeah, so what I like if the that. Disney villains always, like, lived in the shadows behind Magic Kingdom and now are trying to break through. Like, I think the villains that I think wouldn't want to take a backseat to anyone. They wouldn't. They want to be yeah. top of the heap. They're not going to get along, right? So on Disney Cruise Line, I don't know if they still even have it. There oh, used to be a show tonight. on the Magic called Villains Tonight. That's gone. And it was really bad. Uh, and part of it not was, like bad like the villains are bad like just actual. Bad. No, it was just it was just for even the, for the standard that Disney Cruise Line had for other shows it was yeah. beneath that standard. Now, yeah. yes, it was directed more at kids, but it was a lot of this stuff like Maleficent is talking to Hades and she's like, "Remember that romantic day we had together at Castaway Key?" You know, and you're like rolling your eyes so yeah. hard that it hurts, right? And I just I'd rather have this be There's a tasteful on, way to I do it, right? I think a villain's like, land where different villains exist in that land yeah. is different than having an attraction where you bring them all together. They're, they've tastefully put all the villains together before, though. I like – I think about the House of Mouse Halloween. I think about even Kingdom Hearts. I think about some of that stuff. There, there's tasteful ways to have all the villains sort of commingle. I mean even the – people said at Castle Stage shows, the, the um, Hocus Pocus show when they all get together, it doesn't feel like – it doesn't feel forced. It feels, you know, it works. I get it. I get it. I'll I think it will work. I think your HOA meeting point is valid, but I, I think you can do it more tastefully than that. Oh, can I talk about the excavator? I like this yeah. one. The backstory of Dinoland USA and Animal Kingdom revolves around the discovery of dinosaur fossils in a former sand and gravel pit. The benefactor of a local college bought up the site, setting uh, it, its paleontology students to work on uncovering the dinosaur bones. He also founded the Dinosaur Institute, which hosts the dinosaur attraction. Left over from the site's days as a gravel pit was a piece of machinery, the excavator. This, uh, this or car circuit would be home to a heavily themed minecart style roller coaster. The storyline would be that the college students had once again restarted the excavator, using it to transport the fossils. The cars would race through a dinosaur skeleton before being menaced by a moving folk art style dinosaur sculpture. And the excavator was dropped from Animal Kingdom opening day lineup due to the budgetary concerns. Of course, um, you, you may have gone to like I did, gone to Animal Kingdom in its very early days, went to Dino Land and been like, huh, well, there's this one ride and there's a there's a playground and there's a restaurant. And then to the left side, there's there's a tent. What is this big tent? There was a big temporary tent of exhibits, which was meant to be a placeholder for some sort of expansion and obviously for necessary capacity they needed on opening day. It was called the Dinosaur Jubilee. And you could see like fossils and things. Um, but 
Um, that's essentially the land that was intended for the excavator. Uh, didn't happen, and instead Disney went with a much cheaper option in 2002, which was uh, <laughs> Chester and Hester's Dinorama, which added Triceratops Spin and Primeval Whirl and um, the Games of Extinction or Fossil Fun Games, whatever they are, um, and all that. You can still ride Big Thunder Mountain if you want to ride a roller coaster through like an excavation site. This right? would have been neat. I like this idea. I think it's a good idea. I think yeah. it would have been it would have fit the land. Um, I it would have been hard to retheme to Encanto though. Well, the the problem with the land is if you don't know the story, they've done too good a job of telling you that this is like a parking lot turned into a roadside attraction. Like if you oh. don't know that story, you're just like this. Just is cheap. This is I just cheap crap. I love the backstory. The backstory the is better is than the land. Junk. Yeah. Like the rides are terrible, mm -hmm. but I think Dino Land is one of the best backstories because it all makes sense, right? It's. The, they set up, they found fossils, they set up the Dino Institute, and obviously someone, some some entrepreneurs who lived nearby were like, oh, we got to capitalize on this. And so they they opened the store and then we're like, oh, well, what are we, why don't we open some... Also, like, look, Primeval World was a piece of garbage, yeah. but the idea that they built a roller coaster that has the same story as Dinosaur, like yeah. this is the cheap carnival midway version of... Yeah. If Six Flags built Dinosaur... This would be the ride. I love that. There's a couple other places where they tell a similar story, right? So, like, Sid Coenga is in, um, generally yeah. Yeah. is, like, a guy moves from, like, the Midwest. He has a house somewhere in Hollywood. He's into the movies. He starts selling yeah. and collecting Hollywood memorabilia to the point where it takes over his house. It becomes a store. His now, house became a store, yeah. What? His house became a store, yeah. Yeah. So his house becomes a story. It's kind of the same, uh, you yeah. know, with, with Chester and Hester, Right, they start this yeah. kind of roadside thing. Uh, also at Hollywood Studios, you kind of have the story of G Force Records tied in with the Hollywood uh, Tower Hotel, which is an yeah. interesting story. Which is the, the the really quick version is you know big accident at the Hollywood Tower Hotel back in the day. Yeah. People aren't really sure. There's a lot of mystique behind it. Um, that area Sunset becomes a bad neighborhood, but G Force Records has their headquarters there. They're doing so well. They're starting to draw people in and people are yeah. coming. So now they're reopening the Hollywood Tower Hotel yeah. for you to come visit. And that's the premise of that. So that those two things are are interconnected by a story that no yeah. one probably people don't even need to know that. But the But best, when you know it, it makes it more interesting, yeah. gives you that little touch of Disney magic. The best backstories are the ones inspired by real life things, right? So like Pleasure Island. Um, I love the fact that the real, like Granville Market in, in Vancouver, yeah. which is the real inspiration, like the real backstory is it was industrial and yeah. it all closed down. And then 30 years later, everyone looked at each other. It was like, what do, do we demolish this? What do we do with this? And someone was like shopping, dining and entertainment district. Yeah. And then that becomes the backstory of, of Pleasure Island, right? It's, it's. Those are always the best. That's a that's a rabbit hole that we can go down sometime. But there Just are an insane amount of backstories. That's a good episode. Pleasure Island. We do have right. we did a March Madness tournament of backstories. I remember too, that. So we have we do have those written somewhere. All right, Equatorial Africa. I have fun. <laughs> um, so. Epcot was going to get a, a, a pavilion for Equatorial Africa. Right now, you just have like a little. They built. They built eight percent of it. <laughs> right. Um, so Equatorial Africa was intended to be part of World Showcase's original lineup proposed in 1979, being placed between China and Germany. However, it would be pushed back with the intention of becoming World Showcase's first edition with a planned 1983 opening. Yeah. Imagineers would work with Roots author Alex Haley, who served as an advisor as well as the narrator of one of the pavilion shows. Uh, Alex Haley would appear in Epcot Center, the opening celebration in a brief segment talking about the project. Which if and, you've never watched, go watch because they, they show the model and stuff. It's really interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, in contrast to the single nation pavilions that are the rest of the world showcase, Equatorial Africa would be a Pan-African experience devoted to different parts of of East and West Africa along the equatorial belt. Uh, one of the village's central landmarks would be a large treehouse that guests could climb to view a diorama of a busy watering hole on the savanna populated by numerous animals. The central part of the village, the heritage area, would be a cultural demonstration space featuring performers from different nations. Additionally, uh, an exhibit of African art could be found there. There were two main shows that were going to be uh, proposed. Yeah. The Heartbeat of Africa, the story of Equatorial Africa's history told through the music of its different cultures. 
A pre-show would be dedicated to the history of the drum, while the main show would be a trip through Africa's past, present, and future through the eyes of a traditional storyteller. The finale would conclude in a modern African city at an outdoor jazz concert with lasers being projected onto the screen and bringing the instruments to colorful Life. The other show was Africa Rediscovered. Uh, this is hosted by Alex Haley. Africa Rediscovered yeah. was a film that would explore Africa's natural and cultural history, exploring different environments and Africa's status as the cradle of humanity. And being classic Epcot, I'm sure they both would have been really fantastic. I think it would have been, and I think people... They'd be gone now, but... They'd people be don't really realize like how big Africa is, how diverse the different... Geography and culture oh, yeah. is like equatorial Africa. They say east and west. Like that's the only part of Africa I've been to. Right, I've been to Liberia. Yeah, and a couple areas nearby that were hotspots: Sierra Leone and Ivory Coast. Mm. Really, places that are have been marked more for trouble in my lifetime than like for their, yeah. um, you know, natural beauty. But I mean, it is a it's a neat thing. I think what mostly what you get um, from Disney now is East Africa. You know, yeah. like, um, but I think that. Overall, they this is well conceived, yeah. and especially now when you look in Africa, it's just like a place to buy a, a coke and an ice cream, right? And bang on a drum for a minute. I just, I don't know why that this entire continent. Obviously, you have Morocco, which is yeah on the African continent, um, yeah. but this is an area whose culture is largely kind of ignored by Epcot, except this one little small yeah. area. I'm not, I'm not being mean to them, saying they they. They're, they're bad people for doing this. I just feel like it's a hole that yeah. we're not experiencing. Now, if you go to Animal Kingdom, you can get a lot of East African That's culture. That's the thing, there, right? right, is that I think when they built Animal Kingdom, that was the death knell for there ever being an Africa pavilion. Right. I think that's um, – and, and in fairness, there's a little bit of that Epcot – Ness to Animal Kingdom, right? The, the, the animal aspect, the conservation aspect is there, right? And also in that Disney does hire cultural representatives from Africa right. to work at both Animal Kingdom and Animal Kingdom Lodge, Correct. right? So we we got it in a way, which is great. That It's great that that happened. Right. Um, would a pavilion have been great? Absolutely. But we got a whole park that has a whole big section that I think um, does a nice job. Yeah, I just think for a park that educating. is dedicated to sharing the cultures of all these different countries, that yeah. it makes... A lot of sense to uh, to have something there in Epcot still. Yeah, they certainly could yeah. build a single attraction, right? Let's let's be honest. The space that originally existed in that plot to build the full pavilion no longer exists. The marina and that backstage facilities for the nighttime shows have eaten up a lot of that yeah. plot. Um, but you probably at least could knock down the silly stores that now are just sealed and they decided to do art installations, which I'm not saying the art installations are silly, but they just did – art on Correct. those gates. And like, that's great if you're going to just let it sit there, but you certainly could knock down those silly shops, expand back a little bit, at least have a cultural show. Even if you just want to build a little outdoor stage, just something, right? Yeah. A little something. I think it's, I think there's a, there's a way that you can feel, and I don't want to use the word insulted, but you know, if your culture is not even sniffed upon when you go walk around the world showcase yeah. and then what they have is just, you walk past like three drums and a, a Coca-Cola Coca stand. stand. Yeah. I feel like that's a little, yeah, there's, there's something that probably doesn't ring right with a lot of people. Oh, and it was, it was more offensive before, right? So what they mm -hmm. did the last two years, um, it was very, it was a very quiet project. We caught on and posted about it, but like they removed all the like tribal like masks. Yeah. They changed the names of the stores because all the names of the stores were kind of generic and offensive. Yeah. And now they have uh, names and signage that look more traditional in that space. And then they hired those artists to go paint those, those metal gates at the closed store. Um, so they, they're making an effort. I would hope that whoever told them they should do those things, because we know they have like essentially a board of people, a board of advisors who are, are guiding them on these cultural sensitivity changes, right? I would hope someone said like, this this should be more than this though. Like you guys can do something. I'm not asking you to build an e-ticket, but someone should look at this and do something with it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there is space if you think about it between there and Germany, there's some open space. Isn't that where... They were talking about putting Brazil and some no, that's thing. the other Brazil's the other side. It's where the train is. Oh, is that where Brazil? The train would have to move. Yeah, which is very controversial. Or they'd get rid of the train, which would also make people oh, very no. sad. I'm Not gonna word, put it. Bird. I want to put it in. We could put this in the show. I'm gonna open Google Maps and look at um, Germany just my and Epcot. But it's. I mean, they've eaten into the space a decent amount. But I forget how much is actually still back there. Yeah, I mean they they took a lot of land 
they took a lot of land for the back of house stuff for the nighttime shows. But there's room to do something, certainly. I don't know if you want to say. Yeah. But there's not as much, nearly as space. much as there there's used some to be. Space. You could do something. You could do You're a not building theater. an e-ticket. Could, yeah. I mean, I'd sit down restaurant, I'd be all for it. I don't know if they really want to cannibalize Jico. Um and I, I wouldn't say Sana Sanaa's more Indian than it is right. African even. Um but man, I mean I, who would who would knock another restaurant at Epcot? I, mean, I just I, I know it's an uncomfortable topic, but there are a number of a population in America whose cultural roots go back to those certain parts of uh West yeah. Africa that are just kind of glossed over. And and I think it's a missed opportunity. I think we can make room for it somewhere, somehow, even uh even if it were to just recognize something more specific than just like, oh, well, this yeah. is all of Africa. It's a Coke stand and ice cream. Yeah. Just to me, it just, it, there's something that feels wrong when I walk past there. I'm like, oh, I'm in China. I'm in Norway, you know, a very kind of geographically large, but population wise, a very small country, yeah. you know, and then like, oh, you know what? Let's just put everyone in Africa as one continent. Yeah. I just, I don't know. Well, like they were doing it as one continent, but like there was a very, Thoughtful plan of of representing of representing right. everyone in in the continent, right? Like yeah. they, they they had a good plan. It just then once you don't execute that plan and all you leave is this. Uh, kudos to them. They built the the f- the front of the pavilion, right? They built the shoreline and the shop and the little dining. Mm-hmm. They built all that and the little and and you know the village, but yeah. they just didn't follow up. In the wakes chat, Doctor Cinema student posted a. a yeah, there's you know, the the picture the layout, of the overhead, yeah. the map of it. But look, there's space for that. I still, I mean, it's there's some of that has been taken over, but yeah. Well, what's funny is what they did build isn't even there. So I guess they thought they were going to knock down all of that, like basically a year later. Yeah. Imagine building. I mean, those those huts and stuff are pretty themed. Yeah. So so for them to have been like, oh, yeah, in a year from now, just you know, knock it down, and maybe. I swear that stuff was there in 82, but maybe I'm wrong then. Maybe it wasn't there. Maybe they added the little dining and stuff later to cover it up. I don't know. I'd have to look. Uh, Mark in the chat said Russia Pavilion. Um, I think that that is – is that on one of our future I'm episodes? I'm sure that There was Russia, it. Israel as well. So Ru- There is a whole presentation on the Russia Pavilion you could watch on YouTube somewhere. Yeah. Uh, I would really like to talk about the next – I know that this is one that's going to be near and dear to your heart. It certainly is. Um, and I think somebody, I believe someone who's coming to the Stage 89 in May worked on this. Oh, really? And so we might actually get to talk to someone finally who worked on this, which I've never gotten to do. Uh, when it opened in 1989, the Disney MGM Studios was meant to compete head-to-head with the Universal Studios theme park that was coming to Orlando. Disney's new park needed a star attraction, and Imagineers thought a ride based on horror movies would bring in crowds. However, Disney prided itself on being family-friendly, so the company concocted a less frightening theme that starred comedy actor, writer, and director Mel Brooks. The ride would have taken guests through an old hotel that Brooks had supposedly taken over to shoot his next picture. They would then discover the hotel was crowded with ghosts, ghouls, and monsters. Riders would board golf carts that take them, would take them through various rooms that showcased comedic setups. One room contained a vampire who keeps cutting himself as he shaves because he can't see himself in the mirror. <laughs> Another featured a closed bathroom stall with Frankenstein reaching for toilet paper only to grab one of the mummy's bandages instead. The project ran into problems when developers couldn't come up with a cohesive story for the ride, and Brooks left the project to star in and direct the movie Life Stinks. What a, what a decision. The hotel, however, was revamped and eventually became the Twilight Zone Tower of Terror. There's a lot to unpack here. <sighs> this isn't the better of the – I don't know if the other Mel Brooks attraction is in here separated. Did I separate it? I don't know. Um because the other Mel Brooks ride is a, a Castle Young Frankenstein, a Young Frankenstein specific attraction. That might that might be in the I tournament think separately. I think it's episode, separately. Yeah. But I think it began its life as the golf cart ride and then became Young Frankenstein and then more naturally that turned into Tower of Terror, but someone could who worked on it could probably tell us more and we'll have that conversation in May, but uh, Mel the Mel Brooks franchise, I think in the history of film, the least represented, right? Of of the movies that shaped the world in the greatest way, the least represented, like Young Frankenstein and Blazing Saddles, two incredibly important movies, and neither 
has any theme park representation. I would die for you know Rock Ridge from Blazing Saddles as like a little land in a park. That would you be the greatest. You couldn't have a thing. Blazing Saddles. Why not? If you think that they're talking about like, oh, they can't have scary stuff because this park is for families, Disney, and they could I'm have a Blazing Disney Saddles reference in the ride. I'm not saying Disney can do it, but someone else could certainly license from Mel Brooks Blazing Saddles and build a small Blazing Saddles town, like with little street atmosphere and a saloon. Two of them, and like you can't make some of the jokes from uh, the movie, but you can at least have fun with it. I think that movie is hilarious. Mel Brooks a genius, but you couldn't make that movie today. No. I mean, that is, not to compare it to Song of the South, right? Two different uh, situations Don't even bring that, no, because they're two different things, right? Right. Blazing Saddles was, you know, a a movie that that was meant to empower, right? It it plays Mm -hmm. the the white people are dumb and are the bad guys, right? right? It's not... It's the opposite of of any other movie you want to compare to people. I can't believe people think Blazing Saddles is offensive or racist. People only take I think these that's no, wild. Tom, because people don't look at the deeper material. People take these things at face value. Someone shows them one clip and they decide that this shouldn't exist. Yeah. Right? And so Blazing Saddles would certainly be a controversial. Mel Brooks in general, a lot of his material, while hilarious, yeah. is maybe not family appropriate. No, maybe not. But Spaceballs also would be. Yeah, Spaceballs would be great. Spaceballs the, the Space hotel. Balls hotel would still be going on. Yeah. There. Full of What we're going to do, we're going to buy – wow, you just said that on the podcast. Are we allowed to say that on the podcast? I think it's they can podcast. Bleep, right? They can bleep that. It's fine. Um, the Wigs heard it live. It's all right. But um, no, man, if, if, I, if they want to – Disney wants to sell me the Galactic Star Cruiser, we're doing it. I'm going to contact Mel Brooks and be like, you want to build a hotel? A Spaceballs hotel? God, he's, got, he's in his 90s, surely. Yeah. He's he sure is, for anything. Yeah. He's the man. But no, I anything Mel Brooks would have been amazing. I, I can't believe Mel Brooks never ended up doing anything in the theme park realm. I think gone kind of the opposite direction from that when with studios though, right? It's not a – he's like a Hollywood. It's a studio thing. The golf cart yeah. would be how you get around like a studio it backlot type of deal. That those, those days of them embracing the Hollywood culture of a working studio are long gone. All right. The space jetpack ride at Epcot. Yeah. In 1990, Disney announced a new space pavilion in Future World sponsored by Delta Airlines. Because you know they send people to space. <laughs> uh, dream flight. Did you say yeah. Delta? I could pull out the art. <laughs> uh, GE declined to renew its sponsorship for Horizons in 1993, just yeah. as plans were being made to refresh Horizons for the 21st century. The lack of sponsor made Michael Eisner decline the update as it would have been too expensive. We're not paying A refrain that. that has continued for generations. That's too expensive. Uh, Disney then toyed with the idea of turning the Horizons building into the Space Pavilion. Yeah. In this version, one of the attractions had guests suspended from overhead ride rails and vehicles that closely mimicked a space jetpack, and they would be sent on a spacewalk. In 1993, Compact... 1999. Oh, sorry. 19, in 1999, Compaq, the manufacturers of Tom's first laptop. I didn't have a Compaq laptop. That's what it says. Manufacturer of my first laptop. Yeah, who wrote that? I don't know who wrote it. Maybe Jason wrote it. It was the, the whoever. My first laptop was older than that. My first laptop was a Tandy, and it wouldn't do anything unless you put a disc in it because wow. my stepmom won it at like a convention. It was a piece of junk. Um, Compaq, who, if you didn't know, later became uh, got bought by HP. Anyway, yeah. they entered talks with Disney about a possible space pavilion, deciding on just the simulator portion off of the planned pavilion. So, so yeah, the original pavilion had essentially mission space and this spacewalk thing, and it would be more like Wonders of Life or The Land or one of those where you could walk into the building and then venture off into different attractions and, and yeah. dining and retail, essentially, yeah. I mean, obviously we lost Horizons. And- it's a beautiful building. It's a shame. It's the only building that didn't survive yeah. of the future world building. So it's it's sad that it got knocked down. The Mission Space, the one thing Mission Space has going for it, I like the exterior when it's actually maintained, but I don't think the exterior of Mission Space is ugly. I think it's I think it's cool. It's fine for what it is, right? I think it's cool. I think it, it works. I don't, I don't have a problem. That's not the part of Mission Space I have a problem with. But <laughs> it's the rest that of That would have been cool. Do you want me to take this? this oh is, boy, this is a long I love, one. I love And I know you one. love Goofy. No, it's not. <laughs> but this does tie into something I do love dearly. 
Um, so this is Road Trip USA slash Goofy About Road Trips at Disney California Adventure. The idea for a theme land at California Adventure celebrating California's car culture had been kicked around at Imagineering for years. The working premise focused on classic cars, tourist attractions, auto-centric restaurants, roadside architecture, and cross-country road trips popular during the 50s and 60s when vehicles became less about transportation and more about personal expression. Combining an Utopia-style attraction with dark ride elements, Road Trip US USA probably went through the most iterations during the evolution of car land to cars land. Uh, the original ride concept featured a cross-country road trip in a 1962 station wagon past Mount Rushmore, under waterfalls, and across covered bridges. Along the way, riders would encounter oversized chickens and life-size dinosaurs designed to entice motors to stop at roadside attractions. The ride journeyed through a nature's wonderland-style cavern filled with stalactites and stalagmites as a car wash filled with spinning bristle brushes, blowing air dryers, and squirting water jets. Uh, yeah. He went through that as well. Visitors entered Road Trip USA through a Route 66-style souvenir shop advertising strange, amazing, and thrilling attractions not to be missed. And concept art of Road Trip USA hinted at elements that would end up in the massive Ornament Valley rock work that would dominate Cars Land, including distinctive Cadillac Ridge and the jutting Gas Cap Butte. A Willie's Butte. A uh, second version of Road Trip USA added a Disney character to the overlay to it called Goofy About Road Trips, based on the 1995 Goofy movie about a cross-country road trip uh, by the anthropomorphic dog. The, ad uh, the attraction took writers on a journey with the absent-minded Goofy where things went awry and mayhem ensued. A third version of Road Trip USA, dubbed Sally's Road Rally, took visitors through familiar locations in Radiator Springs and into the world of cars. Those plans ultimately inspired the development of downtown Radiator Springs as the centerpiece of Cars Land. So what happened here, basically what was intended to be the first expansion other than Tower of Terror to DCA was, the, was Car Land, which was a celebration of car culture. Opening day DCA didn't work well, right? They had a lot of tongue-in-cheek attractions, um, like let's say Superstar Limo, right. things like that that didn't go over well with people. People didn't like the park. They didn't like the kitschiness. They didn't like Paradise Pier, which was a lot like this too, like a lot of road, either right. roadside attraction or touristy. Tacky. Yeah, a lot of tacky stuff. It didn't read with guests. Guests thought it was very un-Disney. And so that's when they started to morph and were like, well, what if we put characters into it? And that becomes Carland with characters. And what's funny about that Carland version is Radiator Springs Racers is in there. Right. So they knew the movie Cars was coming. So you have that e-ticket, but then the rest of the land you have like, you know, you have a diner, a roadside diner right. with like Herbie the Love Bugs outside. And, um, and then you have this goofy attraction. It was very diverse in Disney IP. And then eventually, you know, John Lasseter, they buy Pixar. John Lasseter comes in as sort of creative, I don't use the word consultant. I feel like he was, he was kind of overseeing all the decisions WDI was making and basically sat there and went, why don't, why don't we just build Radiator Springs? Why aren't we just building Cars Land? Which might have been selfish on John's part, right? Like that's his movie and something he's very passionate about. Um, but you can't argue with the final result, which was – Again, one of the best lands they've ever built, period. So. And I would say Encounter to Your Pandora being the best theme park land ever built, I would say. Well, I didn't say Pandora was the best theme park land ever built. I said one of the yeah. best. Cars Land yeah. uh, is, for my money, now I've not been to Japan. I've not been around He's the like, world. I know what you're going to say, and I'm going to stop you. <laughs> but the ones that I've been to, far and away, Cars Land is It's the best. still up there, even, even against the stuff in Japan. The, yeah. And the... You, I mean, you're in that queue for Radiator Springs Racers, and you yeah. feel like you're on Route 66. Yeah. These weird, kitschy things that work because of the setting that you're in. Yeah. Uh, and then when it gets dark and they turn the neon lights on in there, and there's all, and you feel like you're in Radiator yeah. Springs. Well, that mountain range envelopes you, right? Yeah. Like it's yeah. You 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 do all this, and then there are a number of attractions. These are not other than Radiator Springs Racers. These are not. Big fancy expensive attractions. No, but they're fun. They're but they're fun, fun rides, yeah. and they're uh, out there for you to see. So there's some kind of kinetic energy vibe yeah. in there as you're walking up and down the street uh, with the beautiful lights and all this stuff. Uh, it is, I say, I would say, somewhat ruined by some of the um, atmospheric runoff from Avengers Campus. Yeah, you can hear some of that. Marvel ruined Cars yeah. Land. Um, but in general, I just think that place is note perfect. 
They yeah. couldn't have done much better with that if they uh, if they had a million years to do it. I think yeah. I think it was really well done, uh, and I'm glad that they didn't settle on Carland. I'm glad that John Lasseter was persuasive enough, even though. I would normally say, oh, no, we're just going to slap IP all over the place. I think with cars, it works perfectly. It's still that celebration of California car culture, yeah. for sure, in Route 66. Yeah. Also, like, it hits all the same notes. Like, it made it made more sense, right? You were going to build the diner anyway. And so someone's like, what? Flows. Flows is a diner. Right. Just do Flows, and we'll play Motown music. And it, it's all the same beats, yeah. just in one concise story, right? I mean, I guess you could say that while Route 66 goes through California and areas, yeah. really the areas where Radiator Springs is are not intended to represent California. They're probably more like Arizona, mm, New Mexico. A little some of bit, that, but... Yeah. There are areas of California that geographically are similar, though. So, all right, we'll go with it. Mm. I I just think it's... I think it's perfect. When I go, you can't go there and not it's be a, happy. It's really, like, I think we've tried to calculate where we think Radiator Springs is before. I think it's in the Barstow area, but we won't have this. This is a conversation for another day, but certainly there's architecture taken from those other places. Let's take a road trip. Let's Route do 66. it. Let's I want to, that's a thing that's on my bucket we'll list. Pick up Andy on I the actually want to yeah. do the drive down Route 66. Now, I know I've seen, there are places where you can look up like, oh, this building, Ramon's building is somewhere yeah. in Texas. And oh, they're all listed. This building, yeah, yeah you have all these places that inspired the But I think it'd be cool. Place. I think it'd be a cool road trip to do. Yeah. That'd be a fun one. I mean, you might not be saying that 42 hours into oh, the Oh, I think I'd have fun. Yeah. As long as we go eat, like, in interesting places and go see interesting things, like, I'll be fine. Yeah. I'll survive. <laughs> well, they were having, you know, I and I'm sorry, I, I don't picture... Goofy and Max Goof tooling around in Cars Land. It just doesn't connect well, it with was me different, the way that, but, but yeah, it was a little more kitschy. It was a little more old DCA, right? So John Lasseter, good job arguing for that. Can you say that still? Am I allowed to, am I allowed to say that he did something good? I hate to be that guy, and this is something this is going to be controversial. Like, look, the guy did some things that are obviously very bad and people should be upset about. But at, at his, his job, at his... Yeah. In his career, when he came over in the purchase of Pixar, I think he had uh, more than anyone in that time frame the most positive effect on Walt Disney Imagineering and the Parks and Resorts because John really did love the Parks and Resorts and it showed. Um, yeah, so it's I, not I, uncommon I think for someone boss. with a lot of genius to have a lot of other problems, right? Outside yeah, of their, for their sure. Like their obviously genius. he did a lot of – Things he that did are, bad that things, are, you know. Uh, but that goes go back through history. A lot of these people that are geniuses, yeah. for whatever reason, have yeah. other like Michael Jackson. We could all sit here and agree Michael Jackson did very, very bad things. His art was tremendous. Right. Like his music is tremendous. Same with John Lasseter. His art and his direction, as far as the world of theme parks, was fantastic. He he knew what he was looking at, and yeah. he often would put them in the right direction. Uh, people are not, uh, and we don't need to go down this too far, but. People are not just one thing or the other, right? There can be good facts about bad people. There can be yeah. bad facts about good people. That's life. That's yeah. where the world we live in. No one is infallible, except Figment, but otherwise, except Figment. No, one, no one's infallible. Um, all right. Space Pavilion. This was proposed for the 1980s. It's a different Epcot. one, yeah. Um, a massive attraction that was announced for Epcot early on but never made it, uh, produced with the assistance of author Ray Bradbury. The centerpiece of this pavilion would have been a massive simulator attraction that would have moved an entire theater in sync with outer space visuals. Uh, the official description reads, a huge interstellar space vehicle will transport passengers to outer frontiers of the universe, highlighting man's efforts to reach out for the stars around him from the early pioneers who looked and wondered to modern day space travelers and their triumphs to the challenges and possibilities of future Space technology and exploration. I that's it. All that unbuilt stuff from the beginning of Epcot, I yearn to see just because everything they they did build in that park in the beginning was unbelievable. Like heavily detailed mega attractions. I I would have loved to have at least seen what the, again it'd be gone already. But I would have loved to have seen it at least once and see what it would have been. Yeah. 
We'll move on. You want me to take Herbie? Yeah, take Herbie. This Herbie the Love Bug Dark Ride, Disneyland. A Herbie the Love Bug Dark Ride was envisioned for Disneyland Park. The ride featured a unique ride system where a four passenger car could split in half. It also featured a roller coaster portion as Herbie would ride the Golden Gate Bridge. I can't imagine why this wasn't built. Do we know what it's time like, period? Why this do was? we have to get in on different sides of the car? Why am I separated from you? I don't know. Oh, we're like holding hands with the person next to you, was, and suddenly the vehicle. Was pulls this in the seventies? I think late seventies, early eighties, somewhere in that zone. Yeah, it makes sense. Now we ended up getting uh, we ended up getting a show where a car split in half. With lights, motors, action, and we got a Golden Gate Bridge as a park icon for Disney California Adventure yeah, for a period of they time. They did the bit where Herbie split in half in the yeah. original lights, motors, action. Yep, That's right. Yep. So yeah. there we go. Your your car splitting in half that did not go away. It came back and and now it's gone. Charlie, why don't you tell us about Candy Mountain? You don't remember that? The early days of the internet? Candy Mountain, Charlie. No. No. Oh, we have to show you. I'll show you that after the show. That was a big thing. Candy Mountain Charlie. When I think of Rock Candy Mountain, if it was a Burl Ives that sang the song, Into Big Rock Candy Mountain. No? No idea. I don't know if it's Burl Ives or not. <laughs> Somebody sang that song. Someone put, Jake, uh, Jake got it. He's got the meme. I'll show it to you later. Well, show, show the wigs, Candy. Jake. Well, he did. It's in, it's in the Discord chat. <sighs> Rock Candy Mountain was originally envisioned for Disneyland Park as part of the Storybook Land Canal Boats. Yeah. The Casey Jr. Circus train would have been uh, traveling around it. It was Imagineer and Disney legend Claude Coates who worked on concept art for the mountain back in 1957. And in 2012, it finally got its due when it became a window display uh, at the candy store on Buena Vista Street. Look at that. Yeah, trolley treats. I don't think I've and the trolley I've it. And the trolley yeah. goes around it, yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah, it's one. Have you not looked at the window? No, there's it's some so cool cute. little vignettes in DCA, though, right? You have, I love uh, Buena Vista Street. Yeah. Oh, that I love the um, a Ghirardelli. The, oh, the backdrop. The, yeah, yeah the it's moving cool. Background there. That's in the San Francisco backdrop. San Fransocchio, yeah, they. Thank you very much. I was the one that spotted that first. The day they did it, or whatever. Oh my god. Uh, do you want to take the enchanted? I love forest? this one. This is one of my more UK stuff that we. You, you just killed. Dennis. Apologize to Dennis sorry, at the GM sorry, test track. Dennis? The Enchanted Forest was a multi-zoned interactive play experience built around three United Kingdom literary works and one English legend that led to Disney film treatments. Alice in Wonderland, Mary Poppins, Winnie the Pooh, and Robin Hood. It would have relied heavily on landscaping and topiary structures along with character greeting areas and a few fully realized architectural works to make the worlds of these characters come to life. At the end of the trail was an open-air tent entitled Mousterpiece Theater, a stage for live entertainment, uh, and a Mickey Mouse Review-style Mickey as a Conductor topiary would have been outside of it. The Enchanted Forest would also have brought the United Kingdom a badly needed vertical feature in the form of a scaled-down Big Ben, which on its flip side would have held a rooftop stage where petulant chimney sweeps could dance around to the probable consternation of an unseen Admiral Boom. The area was located between Canada and the UK where the World Showplace Event Pavilion currently stands. So this was just a big walkthrough with meet and greets and child play areas, which is a thing they tried to do forever at Epcot until they finally built Journey of Water, right? Yeah. Um, a little more in-depth than Journey of Water, but but along the same lines, just adding capacity to the park and building out the UK Pavilion a bit more. Uh, before we... Discussed this. I was corrected by Mickey Librarian in chat. Harry McClintock wrote and sang it originally. Burl Live sang a sanitized version oh, okay. of Big Rock Candy Mountain. I don't know which version it is sanitized. on. Sanitized? Uh, well, yeah, there's... It's an inappropriate song? Oh, yeah. Is it about something? I don't know, but I know like they sing about, like along with the candy, there's alcohol and stuff oh, like that, too. I don't okay. know if that's the part that's got sanitized. What kind of rock candy that was, is if it, it? I think they sing it in, like, uh, Oh, Brother, Where Art Thou? It's like... Oh, there, yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. Okay. So, anyway, the there. Enchanted Forest thing would also add the Cheshire Cat Face, the big Cheshire Cat Face from the Alice Maze in Paris. Okay. So it was a bit of inspired by Fantasyland in Paris, for sure, the United Kingdom. For those that don't know, the, the Fantasyland at Disneyland Paris has, a, has sections themed to different countries. There is a UK section, right, that has the Toad Hall Restaurant and Peter Pan, the Alice Maze, 
the Tea Party that and so on. This is a bit inspired. Is that where a- Axel that. told me that like at Disneyland Paris, there's guys selling bootleg merchandise in the maze? Like, hey man, you want to no. buy some of these knockoffs? No, that t-shirts? was Shanghai. Was that Shanghai? Shang- it wasn't bootleg. It was real merchandise because you know the factory is probably not far from the park where the Disney merchandise is made. Yeah, no, in the maze they tried to sell me uh, mouse ears, and then they tried to sell us keychains in on Mickey Avenue. Inside I don't know why I thought Shanghai. that was Axel. I apologize. Your no. story time. But at Disneyland Paris, they did try to resell me tickets while in the park on Main Street. That was yeah. with the first five minutes I ever visited that park. But that part, I've never experienced that since there. It's definitely much different now than it was then. But Rainforest Roller Coaster. All right. Let's do I, it. I alluded to this last show, I think. As part of the never fully realized Project Gemini at Epcot, the land's exterior. Uh, would have been obscured by several attractions, including a rainforest rooftop family-friendly roller coaster. And also a maze was the other thing. It's not there. But At the land, yeah. Yeah, so the outside of the land, they would have used all that green space to add That would be pretty cool, I think. Capacity. I think it's great. I think I think it would be super cool. And we've seen a little bit of it with Moana, right? I think looking at, like, the Seas Pavilion building from Moana is pretty yeah. cool. Like, to see rock work and more thematic formations around these – 80s really interesting buildings like Spaceship Earth and Seas and Land. And right. It could have been really cool to see like a maze in front of the land with that big glass, you know, I mountain in the background. That pavilion, like there are some rides in there. Yeah. It's pretty cool. But I think that pavilion needs some work, some love and care. Like you walk in and you just like – It's blue. On one hand, you're like, oh, yeah, there's some original stuff from yeah. the 80s that I will – that Tom would chain himself to if they tried Just to remove it. Just the balloons. It. Just the balloons. But the balloons aren't the problem. Mm-hmm. The rest of the interior, when they did the, the airport update yeah. in 05, right, when Soren came and they made it kind of themed to an airport, yeah. it, it hasn't aged well. It looks bad. Can we, can we pause and talk about that? Because I've not been to Tokyo, but I've been to DCA, and the theming around Soren makes a lot – it's just I, it's just better, yeah. oh, right? Yeah. You're like the – you're in Condor Flats, and it's more like a classic aviation – uh, well, now it's Grizzly Peak Airfield. Right. But so, both versions work. But you yeah. have these sort of banners celebrating people who are important to the history of aviation. Yeah. And it has a certain, uh, I guess a, a, the best way I can describe the feel is like a leather helmet aviator yeah. feel, right? Yeah. You have that kind of, now they're celebrating the people pioneer, like Chuck Yeager. And the some pioneering of spirit of, of early. Yeah. Correct. And now you get to Epcot and it's kind of sleek and these perforated metal walls. And it's never been a good cue. Neon light things, and I, yeah. I just don't, I don't Soren, understand why they made that choice. And I understand because yeah, money. It actually no, this this modern sleek metal thing does go better with the idea that you are being greeted by a chief flight attendant, even though you're on a hang glider. Yeah, like there's a, just a oh, lot. Oh, nothing that, about Soren makes sense. Right. But let's be like, look, I know I understand people love Soren. I love the music. I like the pre-show. I've never liked Soren. Soren was the highlight of the lowest, darkest period in the history of the parks and resorts, right? Soren was like the one shining that and like filler magic, the 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 you know, the glimmer, the 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 fading light in an era in which it felt like the place was gonna fall apart. Um but Soren never made sense, right? It's oh, we're at an airport. Oh, there's a flight attendant. Oh, we're getting on a hang glider. <laughs> what? Yeah. Huh? I don't get a lot of that, but I I I think the attraction connects with people because it has become yeah. a touchstone for their families on trips they've gone on. Oh, it's or a memories fun ride. That they've like made it's, together it's, on that ride. Yeah, it's I get it. Probably the most memorable ride that they went on at Epcot during those years. Right, that was one that had very yeah. long queue, and you know it was often ninety. Uh, I know why people minutes. love it, but but in the realm of like Disney attractions, does Soren deserve? To be in the same breath as Pirates of the Caribbean, Haunted Mansion, you know, any of those. No. It's but a, it's it's in that Splash Mountain, any of those. It's not – it's in that conversation and it's like, well, those other things are highly detailed – Tower Terror. Highly detailed, innovative things that, that, that tell a very in-depth story. And then you look at Soren, it's like, yeah, they invented this really fun and cool ride system. Like Imagineering, to their credit, R&D, came up with something really cool. But the way it was worked in any park doesn't. But then you go to, you know, the the saving grace is like the California one's a step up. And then you go to Tokyo and it's like, oh, wow, okay. 
So you built, and still, like, the ride still doesn't do anything for me, but the queue, you're like, this all at least makes sense. Someone finally sat down and was like, OLC's going to pay for this. Yeah. Let's give them the story in which the hang glider makes sense, that we're actually getting on, like, it's Camellia Falco's, it's her dream flyer, and we're going to get on it, and it's, there's a magical bird, which is the reason why we're going to be able to go to all these places around the world and transport Instantly between them, you know. Well, soaring over California, um, you know, at DCA, it fits really well. It's more I think. logical, and it it feels like a celebration of this sort of adventurous spirit. Yeah, and the actual film feels like you feel that at some points, yeah. right? You're following the, you know, going up over a rise, and some people riding horses, and that's oh, great. Uh, it's it's the pacing, great. everything. I think about soaring it. around the world, soaring, whatever you want to call it, is it feels like Garbage. a cinematic scene from a video game. It, yeah. I, it doesn't seem to have any heart. It's like, oh, well, it was, let me guess, they're going to fly a kite right in front of me for a yeah. transition, and they're going to throw dirt. It just So it was like, if we want to be honest for a minute, and this may rub some people the wrong way, and I apologize, it was made for a different audience. It was produced for Shanghai Disney, where, you know, that is a communist country. It's a different world. Those There's yeah. not a lot of people with money there. It's a world where people take out loans to go to Shanghai Disney just to afford day tickets, right? It's yeah. a very different world from the world you and I live in um, where expectations are, and, are, and sensibilities are very different. And so when they, when Tom Fitzgerald and team were putting that together, it was like, well, we can do a new Soren, but you have to do this, 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 and this. And one of the things was, you know, it's the things – you got to have things fly in people's faces. It has to be a thing, right? And they thought that that worked better for the Chinese audience. Um, and that's what they did. And did it work well for other audiences? No. I think the American audience, uh, it was a resounding, this isn't as good when Soarin' Around the World debuted. And also like the those, <laughs> we won't even get into the the view problems, right, of the things curving. Um, I, I was told that's a, like a technical thing. Like they used some incorrect technology in the yeah. setup. Of the you, you knew the curvature of the screen and everything. You did it in 2001. And yeah. suddenly now you're incapable of figuring this out. Come on. Come on, guys. Get it together. Really? Um, for those that don't know, Soren over California for now is at Epcot. Uh, it debuted last month. Until they decide it's not. Yeah. And uh, at DCA, you can see it annually. during They, they debut it during the Food and Wine yeah. uh, Festival. They gave us free cuties um, on the way out. But, yeah, if you want to see it, I, who knows? I don't know when it's leaving Epcot. Do you know? For Have they announced for sure? It should be the end of the year, but I, I am hoping and praying that people, you know, I, I would tell people if they go to Epcot, let everyone know how much more you like it. Stop at guest relations. You know, people stop at guest relations to complain. Stop at guest relations and go and just be like, I just want to leave a note that I'm so happy the old Soren is back, and I hope you guys keep it. That'll be filed somewhere. Yeah. Like, let them know, right? And if ridership goes up too, right, if you go there and you ri go ride that two or three times in a visit, whatever, all those things make a difference. And I would say let Disney know that you're happy it's back. Or if you're not going to make it before it goes away, you know, tweet at them. Go on the Disney Parks or Disney World Facebook pages. Go right underneath yeah, the comments and be like, something good. hey, guys, like, I just want you to know, like, I know you're going to get rid of this, but I would really love, you know, I, I was looking forward to this, and I, I wish you guys would extend it or at least bring it back sometime annually. I would really like to see the original Soren again. Let them know. You don't have to be mean, right? Like, we don't have to. Look, when they do something that's worth being mean about, I'll be the first one to grab the pitchforks with all of you, and we'll all go charge the castle. But... When they do something good like this, it's good to just politely just go in there and be like, I like this. Thank you, guys. Could you do it longer? Or or could you just leave this? We would we would love that. My my family would love that. And someone will pay attention. If enough people do it, they'll pay attention. So go let your voice you, be heard. If you like something, let them know, right? Yeah, like people think I just complain about everything. Like I certainly let them know when something great happens, right? You know, I go leave cast compliments all the time. Well, man, I don't know how you do this, by the way. People wear glasses all day long, every day. I don't know how you do it. You get used to it. I don't know. I've, I've always struggled with it. Maybe. Oh, is this one mine? Yeah, you want to take Rainbow, Rainbow Road? Rainbow Road to Oz. In 1957, Walt Disney announced plans for a new film called The Rainbow Road to Oz, a live-action musical based on the L. 
Frank Baum book, The Patchwork Girl of Oz. The film would star his Merry Mouseketeers, and Walt took the opportunity to promote the film on the Mickey Mouse Club. Walt also had plans for a possible theme park attraction based on the Oz tales. Tony Baxter would later draw plans for an Oz the Great and Powerful themed land at Disneyland, but the movie didn't succeed as planned, and the land was instead used for Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. Makes sense, right? That's an MGM property. Is it not? I mean, it's not if Wizard you make another film. If you make a new film, there are other Oz films. Disney yeah. made one eventually, Return to Oz. Um, and then Disney also made Oz the Great and Powerful, which the the rumor is that – let me talk about this. The rumor is that Tony Baxter was on the payroll and they didn't really have anything for him to work on. Um, and they knew Oz the Great and Powerful was not going to be a huge hit, but they made him work on – this plan for the park anyway. That's the story I've heard. Could not, it could be fake. I don't, I don't stand by that, but um, it's a really interesting story that they made him draw up an Oz land. And they tease it. There was a D23 uh, magazine where they tease it where Tony said he was working on something new for Disneyland and they didn't really show what it was. Um, it was that, but we it um, didn't happen. I think we've talked about this. Uh, some people know I grew up in Kansas, right? I'm from Lawrence, Kansas yeah. is where I grew up. And um, there was a tornado somewhere between <laughs> <laughs> you and your small dog were lifted into <sighs> the air. <laughs> if you're anybody from Kansas is rolling their eyes because all they ever hear when they say Kansas is someone say something about Toto or be Dorothy. interesting for something else. Yeah. Then be um, more interesting. <laughs> so they were going to build, uh, but somewhere between Lawrence and Kansas City off of K10, there was an old like. Army ammunition plant, hmm. hundreds of acres of land yeah. uh, that has become like a super fun site. Now I think it's going to be a Panasonic yeah. electric vehicle battery plant. But for years and years and years, they were saying, oh, this is going to be an Oz theme park. Yeah. And we've got all these people, we've got billions of dollars lined up and they're going to they're gonna make the highway for miles in each direction, like a yellow brick road and all this stuff. They always want to do this and like, I'm like, you guys know it's really cold here in the winter, and it's really hot here in the summer. Who's going to come here for this? And I don't know if that's why they never did it, but I've I've heard most of my life that someone's going to build this Wizard of Oz theme park. So someone's happened. building a land. Do you know this? Um, Warner Brothers Movie World in Australia. Oh, yeah? Is It's announced. Yeah, I have it here if you want to see it. Wow. Um, I don't think it's going to be. Maybe it's the same people. No, I don't think so. Um, but they have, they're have they calling it a Wizard of Oz precinct. Prepare to journey over the rainbow uh, with a world-first Wizard of Oz precinct, including two new family-friendly rides coming to Warner Brothers Movie World in 2024, featuring a suspended coaster, a boomerang racer, and immersive theming. The Wizard of Oz precinct will be designed to thrill the entire family. Experience thematic elements, including projection mapping, stunning sculptures, and facades as you travel along the yellow brick road. Um, by the way, clarification. Someone said, wait, how do we jump from the 1950s to Galaxy's Edge? For the no, Tony Baxter later. That's later, yeah. So later basically, had come up with plans. Yeah, funny enough, in the 50s they thought about it, but then um, when, Oz the, when Disney came back to Oz the Great and Powerful. There is, though, other than the great movie ride, which had a scene for Wizard of Oz, there is one other Oz attraction that was built that is the return to Oz scene of uh, Le Pays de Conifay, it, that storybook land canal boats in Paris, ends with Return to Oz, uh, which is also my favorite thing because the music that plays is from the Main Street Electrical Parade finale for, for Return to Oz. Really? Yeah. And it might get removed in the refurb. That's the word. I can't on the wait street. for I'm a business sad, trip for the company to send me out. You there might for, miss it. It's closing. Hard it's going to close news. for this update soon. You it's might not, not get Do they have to blue see flying it. monkeys out there. No, it's just a little scene, and it plays electrical parade music, and it's the it's the Emerald City. But I love oh, it. Oh, yeah. I like those guys. Yeah. All right, Arab Nations Pavilion. And you skipped one. Oh, we there's our hedge maze. There you go. There's your hedge maze. All right. As part of the never fully realized Project Gemini for Epcot, we talked about before. Yeah. Uh, the Land Pavilion was going to get a hedge maze in the exterior portion of it. It would have been obscured. By several attractions, including a large scale hedge maze. The land's exterior would yeah. have been obscured by several attractions, Just including like the, a large scale. The coaster hedge maze. we talked about a few minutes ago. What's with all the hedge mazes, man? 
We're going to have one in the UK. We're going to have one at the land. I think people just kept trying to get one made. I think they're fun, you know. The, the Alice one, I think once people saw the one in Paris, they're like, oh, this is really well done. We should have one of these. This have is, you have you actually been lost in there or is it pretty? It, you can get lost. Like the first time I went in there, it, it's more walkthrough, but there's definitely a part later where you could make wrong turns. Um, you probably won't get lost for long, but you can make some wrong turns for sure. And I've done it. You want to do the last one since that one was real short? Yeah. Go ahead. I'll do it. Uh, Arab Nations Pavilion yeah. at Epcot. Uh, the pavilion wasn't made up of just one country, but rather a collection of them. Yeah. Egypt, Syria, Iran, Jordan, Tunisia, and Morocco would have been represented here. Guests would enter into the pavilion and pass an Arab souk, which is a, a bazaar, uh, which would feature a circular restaurant on the second floor. Just beyond that would have been a flying magic carpet ride. A genie would appear from a bottle via projection, of course, and act as a host through the region's past and present. Your carpet would actually fly through the genie into a star-filled night sky where you'd learn about Arab contributions to astronomy, navigation, and mathematics, and mathematics, and how they have affected Western culture. The journey would continue to fly over scenes showcasing Arab contributions to science and architecture that have shown their influence all over the world. In the end, this version never got built, and then Morocco opened instead. Yeah. I mean, this sounds cool. This would have been an Aladdin ride at some point, but, you know. Oh, they definitely would have. This is, you know, there was also, uh, you know, a Persian resort that they were going to build at one yeah. point, right? So there are some Arab world representation that never happened yeah. throughout. I think the Persian resort was going to be kind of between TTC and Contemporary. Is that right? Or is, is that, that the, the one that would have been is it the one across north the street of, from Contemporary? I think it was the one north of Contemporary. There's an easy way to remember, though. Mm. Our resort was located on the shores of Bay Lake, not the Seven Seas Lagoon. Yeah, so the one this was the north. Of, okay, it's on Bay Lake. Yeah, where so they, facing yeah. the other way, but north of of Contemporary, right? All right. Well, that never happened. No. Uh, and the uh, but can we talk about with Morocco? What is Disney waiting for? Right? Why Why isn't Marrakesh back as character dining with Aladdin characters? Why has that not happened yet? Is it? Are they afraid to add it? Is it? Not easy money. Is it, I just I hate that the back of this pavilion's dead. I'm ready for them to do something with it. Or if they don't want to not do that and just build an actual attraction back there for Aladdin, that'd be great. If and if you're watching this and and you're planning a, a trip soon, that is a great area to relax. Grab yeah. a drink and go back there in that market, which yeah. looks like it's open air, but is you know like it's actually covered. translucent yeah. roof, and yeah. go back there and have a seat, and it's. There's a, just enough breeze to keep the air moving in there. You yeah. got some shade. It's nice and pleasant. It's a great place. Every time I go to Epcot, yeah. we end up back there. And, well, maybe not last night when I went to Epcot, but most times when I go to Epcot, most time. we'll, we'll stop there. That's a great spot. So, no, keep doing what you're doing. Keep it abandoned, Disney. I like it back there. No, I, I it's time to do something back there. That restaurant is kind of small. Marrakesh? Yeah, don't you think? Better to use it than to not use it in that, that stupid Blue Cross Blue Shield lounge thing. Yeah, that was nice while it lasted, though. They have, for those that don't know, there was, um, for a period of time, post-COVID, there was a Blue Cross Blue that Shield. That came back this year. Is Was it back again? It might even still be open. No way. Really? Let's see what dates we have listed for it. You can go back there and use the air conditioning. I don't know. <laughs> Eric's uh, like a few years ago. I'm like, you mean now? No, I didn't think they had it this year. It came back, yeah. Okay. Well, good. They have a little lounge. You can go sit there. Drink <laughs> water. Cool off. Ago. Um, yeah, September 3rd, it, around the beginning of September, it opened again. And I believe, I believe it's still open. It might be open through the end of food and wine, maybe. So how bad does it look for me that not only did I not know that, but I also just said Oh, that November I, 18th, it sounds like, yeah. It closes November it, 18th? That sounds like that'll be the end. Yeah. How bad is that? I, I told people nearly every visit to Epcot, I go back there, and I haven't even noticed that <laughs> that thing is open. And it's 20 feet away on the other side of a meet and greet. There we go. Yeah, people in the chat, they would love to see Aladdin back there. Uh, Jafar could hypnotize us into ordering more drinks and desserts. Wow. That'd be good. I think they or, would do you know, something. Or, you know, if I was in charge, I would build Sinbad's storybook adventure there, but, you know, or storybook voice. Is there sorry. room? I don't know, but I just knocked down one of the adjacent pavilions. It doesn't matter. Just, just knock down whoever's Can we nearby. knock down Remy? Remy's in the spot next to it. That's garbage. Just knock that down. <laughs> 
heard of it. Hey, I'm with you. Shandu I would love merchandise to see that will outsell Remy. I promise you. The yeah. cute, the cute tiger with the turban. Oh yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna outsell Remy, even though it's a beloved great movie um, that's done no favors by its shoddy projection, universal projection ride that they built. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, this just in, Tom's not a big fan of Remy's Ratatouille oh, adventure. I like it more than Runaway Railway, at least. So, yeah. Well, look, that concludes this round of 16. Yeah. So uh, let us know in the comments which one you would like to have seen built. Yeah. And uh, offer your insight. We're going to keep doing these till we get all 64 of them done, I guess. Yeah, might as well. Might as well. That's what people like. Hope they, I hope they're enjoying it. The, the, the world that might have been. Yeah. So we want to thank you for joining us. Um, by the way... Carousel of Products, carouselofproducts.com. You can buy T-shirts, pins, By the time this is out, hats. the Gertie shirt might be back. The Gertie too. shirt will know. be restocked soon. Sometime November. in mid, early to mid-November. Early November, it'll be uh, restocked. Uh, yeah. You can buy this long sleeve uh, Gertie shirt. It's yeah. beautiful. And uh, carouselofproducts.com. You can go shopping there. There's all kinds of shirts on there, and we have some sales that are still going on. Yeah. Are they? Is the sale still going on? I don't, I don't know. know. <laughs> Maybe not when this airs. We don't know anything. It's the lounge open and what's on sale. And we, we, we don't leave this room. We, <laughs> someone came and cut my hair while I sat in this chair, and then we just started recording again. That's all we do. We sit here all day long. Oh, man. But no, okay, seven episodes down. We're, we're doing seven. great, Tom. Yeah, we might make it to episode 10 eventually. Maybe. Keep your fingers crossed. We'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us. See you real soon.